right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for that nice introduction. Our opening praise song is, uh, is Mighty to Save. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Amen. Let's sing this together.
our offering prayer this morning. And uh, we have an offering basket on the table right here in the middle. If you brought your offering today, please feel free to bring it and put it in the basket anytime during the service or right after the service. Thank you. So let's go to the Lord now in a time of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we read from your word that when you asked the disciples to feed the multitude, they reluctantly said to you, all we have is five loaves and two fish. You simply said to bring them here to me. And when they brought them to you, you did a great and mighty wonder, Lord, that was beyond anyone's imagination. Lord, we are so thankful that we can come before such a, a great God, such a wonder-working God with our prayers and our burdens. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful fall morning to gather together outside once again. Thank you for this time of year where the bees begin to change and the colors are just so bright and you just can observe and just glorify you through your handiwork. Lord, I pray for Exodus Bible Fellowship Church as we continue to go through this time of transition and challenge. Just pray, Lord, you keep uh, everyone free from the from the virus. And we just, uh, again, we just uh, thank you that we can begin to open up some of the ministries now. And uh, we just pray for the, the Sunday schools that are going to open soon and pray that even the adult Sunday schools would soon uh, get back in the in form again and the, and the small groups. And we just pray, Lord, for wisdom to do this safely and uh, and well and lord we just uh, also again just pray for your guidance lord and your counsel as we continue to seek for a new lead pastor for this church we just uh, pray lord just give us a discerning spirit to bring in that man that you have already chosen to lead this local church lord we just uh, thank you for the missionaries we are able to support i just want to pray today especially for marcia montenegro who we supported for quite a few years now and she has a, a great ministry reaching out to uh, new age and occult type teachings and just sharing your truth with the radio cast and, and podcast to just share your word in a way that can reach so many that have been the, just deceived by false teachings and Lord we just pray for our congreg con congregation for some folks that have some physical needs uh, we do have some folks that have stroke related issues uh, right now and these can be very serious so Lord, I just pray you would just uh, bring healing to, to those, Lord, to your goodwill, to wisdom, to the families, to the doctors. And Lord, I just pray for folks that are either facing surgery or struggling to recover from surgery. May you just be with them in a special way. We also want to pray for our president today, too, president of our country. I see now, and the first lady has been diagnosed with the, with the COVID virus. Lord, we just pray your healing touch to be upon him. May you bring speedy healing to him, uh, to his family. And again, Lord, we just pray for our nation as we go through these turbulent times. We just pray that righteousness will prevail in these upcoming weeks before the election. And Lord, now I just uh, pray you be with Pastor Bob as he brings your word this morning. We just thank you for him, Lord, and just open our ears, Lord, and our spiritual insight to, to just to understand the truths you want to reveal to us today. Now, Lord, thank you for the offering. Thank you for all the folks that brought the offerings today. And Lord, we just pray that you have wisdom to use them effectively and wisely for your work here at this church. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. If you do need the uh, copy of the lyrics, uh, there should have been an email sent out to you, and you could uh, you could check them on your phone, or if you need a paper copy, there's some up here. I see most of you with paper copies, so that's good. Sing with us, uh, uh, I Surrender All. This is our, this is our song of... of uh, praise and, and uh, giving back to our Heavenly Father.
You may be seated. The Lord certainly has blessed us with some wonderful weather uh, for these outdoor services. I was a little concerned when I saw the weather report initially that it might be too cold, but uh, obviously it's not. So I got a question for you. Suppose I had received a telegram from a, a very reliable source, I don't know what that source might be, that told me for sure Jesus is coming back on November 30th of this year. It's a done deal. It's not questionable. It's guaranteed. It's right from the source. Maybe it was an angel from heaven. Whatever it was, it doesn't matter. This is for the, for the sake of illustration. Jesus is returning November 30th. How would you change your life between now and then? What would you do different? Now, if you knew the world was ending and you wanted to say goodbye to everybody, that's one thing. But this isn't an end. This is a new beginning. This is November 30th. You're going to be standing face to face in front of Jesus. What would you do different? Well, the morning of November 30th, you'd probably take a shower. But other than that, <coughs> excuse me, what would you do? Would your priorities change? Would you live your life in a different way for these next few weeks? The things that are important right now, the things that are, are filling your week in the days to come might change dramatically. If you knew you only had, however many weeks it is, let's say eight weeks, between now and then, would it change the way you interact with family members who don't even believe there is a God? Would that change? What would be different? You might want to make an effort in the next eight weeks to spend all of your money because it's not going to be worth anything on December 1st because we're going into a whole different system, right? Spend it wisely, I suppose. Suppose you found out the very first thing he was going to do was, in fact, to review your life and all that you'd done. In the last hundred years or so, at least since the 1820s or 1920s, the church, the kind of churches that we are, Bible churches, churches that believe the Bible is the word of God, began to drift to the gospel. There was a controversy in the 20s, partly because of, of the Darwin trials, where the church split, and the liberal church, as we call them today, sort of left the gospel behind and concentrated on social works. And churches like ours concentrated on the gospel and left the social works behind. Not entirely for either one, but they majored in those areas. They were never meant to be separated. James said, and we refer to this often, that your faith is given evidence to you and to others by the works that you do, right? Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Apparently, the way you live, commonly referred to as your works, does matter. We spend so much time stressing that it's by grace you're saved through faith, and that's absolutely true. That's what Scripture says. But that faith will result in works. The two are never meant to be divorced either. So here we come to the parable of the talents today. We're in Matthew 25, verse 14. Now that is a backdrop. Jesus and the disciples were coming out from the Temple Mount. And this is called part of, the parable of the talents is part of the Olivet Discourse. Well, it said that because by the time they got to discoursing, they were on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives overlooks the Temple Mount. It's a place where for centuries, literally centuries, people have gone and looked down on the Temple Mount. If you go today to Israel, I had the good fortune to be there a number of times, you always pose on the Temple Mount as a group with 
the, the Dome of the Rock in the background across, across the valley. That's more or less where Jesus and the disciples were. And they're, they're looking down on the, on the temple, and the disciples are, are lauding it. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, not one stone upon the other will remain standing here. This is the place he was when he wept over the city, basically, and he's coming down. And as he's there, he's privately talking about the end times. And the disciples say to Jesus, tell us when these things will happen. Is it really going to be November 30th, 2020? When are these things going to happen? We want to know. And Jesus responds to them. Matthew 24, verse 36, concerning that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. They want to know how to prepare. And see, Jesus begins to tell them these parables. He tells them the parable of the household. And he said, make sure that you're feeding people. Who then is the wise and faithful servant, meaning believers in Jesus, whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? What's food in Scripture? Food is the Word of God. That's the first thing. How do you know what to do and what not to do? How do we know how to resist the lure of the culture when it's pulling us away from God's will when we don't know what God's will is? Make sure you're being fed by the Word, he says. He goes on about the parable of the virgins, and the essence there is to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not just hanging around the church, remember, Five were ready with their lamps full, and five weren't. And then, after that, then he gets into the parable of the talents. How can I be ready, Lord? How can I be ready for when you come, and what do you want me to do in the meantime? Matthew 25, verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more, but he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered me two talents. Here I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered those seeds. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master, master answered him, You wicked, slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered those seed. Question mark? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents, for to everyone who has will more be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, we come today to study your word, and we know apart from your spirit interpreting it for us, we can't quite get it. And we pray that our hearts and minds would be open to your truth and open to allowing your spirit to tell us not only what it means, but how to apply it individually to our lives. Bless this time to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He's telling this parable to his disciples, to his followers who are interested. He uses the example of a man going on a long journey. Okay, that's referencing him. He's going on a long journey. He's apparently still on it. The servants who received the talents would refer to those who were following him, to his disciples. 
So the man go, or the master is Jesus. The servants or slaves or followers or, or basically apparently believers. If you look at it closely, they're not equal. That's a misconception we have today, that we believe that the Bible says all men are created equal. The Bible doesn't say that. The Declaration of Independence says that, but the Bible doesn't say that. Now, it means different things. We're not all equal, are we? I can't play basketball. I, I can't play anymore football in the NBA or in the NFL. I probably never could in the NFL. There's a ton of things I don't do well, and there's a ton of things you don't do well. We're not all equal. What that meant in the Declaration was that we all have equal standing before the law. We all have the right to demand a fair trial and things like that. We all should be treated fairly. In that sense, we're all equal. But we're not all equal, and this seems to point to that. He talks about talents. I think Pastor Reed last week mentioned talents as well. It's a lot of money. Basically, a talent's a lot of money. It could be 20 years' worth of salary, one talent, for our purposes. It's just a lot of money. That's all you need to know. It's a lot of money. And it's not their money. He gave them the money. So it's not their money. It's not theirs to use on themselves. It's theirs to use for the glory of God or for the glory here of the Master. It's given to them, but it's not given equally. It's given according to their abilities. So, and the time frame's a long time frame. So what can we learn from this? What are we supposed to learn from this? What were the disciples supposed to learn from this? Well, I think the first thing is that God gave you your talents. And maybe for us, maybe the important thing is to realize that, you know, God isn't going to give us in one shot, probably, most of the time, 20 years worth of salary. Unless, of course, you win the lottery. And many would say, as a believer, you probably shouldn't be playing the lottery. So you're probably not going to win it. And if you did win it, you wouldn't tell anybody at church, right? So, <laughs> but it's unlikely that that's going to happen. But God has given you life. And I think really for all of us, the talent represents the opportunity we have during the life we have. It's different for all of us. We're all shaped different. We all have different personalities. We all live in different places. We all have different experiences. It's different for each of us. He gives us a variety of opportunities. If you have an evangelistic spirit, you might have the opportunity and make the opportunity and see the opportunity to share Christ with people. You'll probably never have the opportunities like a Billy Graham did to share with millions of people or to share in an Oval Office with multiple presidents. He was peculiarly gifted, peculiarly given opportunities to do that. But each one of us, each one, will have opportunities. One of the things that gets me excited about church is a church is a gathering, right, of people. That's what the word literally means, those that are drawn out, ekklesia in the Greek, those that are the called ones. And in any church, a church like, like Exeter, we have 200 people, let's say. That's 200 people with gifts. That's 200 people who each of you know, I, I'm guessing, well more than 10, right? And 10, to do the math easily, would make 2,000 people. Let's say you know 100, that's 20,000 people that we have connections with. That's incredible. The opportunities that we have at our doorstep as one church are enormous. So between, between now, think about it, between now and November 30th, when Jesus comes again, what are we going to do with those opportunities to make a difference where we are collectively? Why did God draw this church together in this place, in this moment? He did because there's something he wants us to do. There's a difference he wants us to make. It's not insignificant that we're here. 
and we're here now. It's incredibly significant. I was at a meeting here once back in 1980-something. The congregation was gathered outside about where the kitchen is, as I recall. This building wasn't here. That building, that's a separate building, actually. That wasn't here. And we were, we were praising and committing the, the, the land to the future, to what the Lord had as we were getting ready to build this building. The school was still in existence. It didn't have the space that it has now to operate. And back then, until recently, it was totally a ministry of the church. But there were people gathered, probably then, I would guess, outside, four or five hundred with a vision for the future about the difference that can be made through everybody that came through the doors of this church for the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. That's no different. Understand, God is not obligated to divvy out opportunities equally. He divvies them out according to his plan, for his purposes, for his glory. He can give you more or less than others, and he does. You have more than some in opportunities and gifts, and you have less than others. That's true of everybody. You have more money and talent and opportunity and strength and better health and better connections than some other people, and less than still some others. And it doesn't really matter, because it leaves us with two choices. We can either gripe about our situation and use it as an excuse for not moving forward. Oh, if I only had more, if I only had more time, if I only had fill in the blank, or, or we can accept who we are and what we have and start there and do what we can. And the ironic thing is, if we complain and whine about what we don't have, we'll never do anything. And if we do even the smallest thing It'll make a difference bigger than anything we can imagine. I remember reading about a man in another church that people would point to and say, well, you know, he doesn't do anything. He just shows up, stands around, drinks the coffee, complains when it's not hot enough or when there's no cream. Everybody has one of them, by the way. But one day he died. And the people realized that he had faithfully opened the church, that he had faithfully greeted, warmly greeted everybody and handed out bulletins, and suddenly nobody was doing that. Sometimes you don't know what people do and contribute until they're not doing it. There are some people here. I won't name them because if I did, they'd be really upset. There are some people here that have been faithful, faithfully doing ministry for a very long time godly people that serve mostly unnoticed that make a huge difference. And that's not beyond any one of us to do that. That's been, that's been the truth of practically every church there is. There are always a faithful core of people that make the thing work. And they are blessed and given increasing opportunities to serve God. So the question is, the first question here is, what has God given you? What talents what abilities, what opportunities has God given you in this day, in this age, and in the future? The church is going to be different. A little rabbit trail here. I believe the church is going to be different. All churches are going to be different on the other side of COVID. We're not just going to go back to the way it always was. Partly, I think, from, from the Lord's perspective, the way it was wasn't quite working in very many places. We weren't getting out enough. We weren't really engaging the, the people around us, the non-believers around us. We weren't making a difference for the kingdom. And I'm speaking generically of most churches. And I think this is an opportunity to change. People will come back slower. People will come in slower. It'll be different. I don't know what it'll be like, but I believe it'll be different. A tremendous opportunity to jump in and take hold and see what God has. The second piece of this, though, is it's pretty clear that the master returned. There is a coming judgment. 
Remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I am not unaware. I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So the, the master returns and settles accounts. Now, there's some confusion about theology. Sometimes we think because we pray, we believe. Because we study the Bible and huddy huddle together, we believe that we won't have to face the judgment. Well, that's true in part. But there's still a judgment of believers' works. Remember the crowns they talk about. You will receive a crown of glory, that type thing. So when Jesus returns, if you're a believer, your sins won't be judged. They've been judged at the cross. But your works will. We don't talk about that very much. There is a sense in which we are... How, how many times have people said, only what you give to the Lord is something you're sending on before you, right? Well... There's a sense in which that's true. The one with five earned five and gets rewarded. The one with two earned two and gets the same reward. They both earned 100% on the amount they were given. It's for the master alone to judge. It wasn't anybody else. It wasn't somebody that came up and said, well, you know, this guy, this guy got lucky. He put it on the right stock and he, and he got the, the reward or he bought the right goods and sold it for a gain. Nobody cares. They only cared at the, the bottom line here. Both increased 100%, both received the well done and the promise of a share of the master's joy and increased responsibility. Now, there's the judgment. What does he say to them? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your master's joy. Well done, my good and faithful servant. We often use that phrase as if it's automatic for everyone who believes that the minute you show up in heaven because you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you get well done, my good and faithful servant. That's not what the Bible says. It says it was given here in this parable to those that had served well. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 that some are saved as by fire. In, in other words, they get nothing. Everything they've done in life is consumed, and they stand there in white robes with charcoal on them because of the fire, they're still in heaven, but they got nothing. And, and it's not like you're sending ahead to build a bigger mansion. I think the crowns we get are crowns we lay at the Savior's feet. We don't carry them around to show off in heaven. That's just not the way heaven works. So it's for the master to judge. The one with one talent hid his, returned the talent, he's rebuked. And his character is displayed. He's lazy and he's wicked. Now, we might not be able to determine why exactly he's wicked. The master said that. There's nothing here in particular that says he's wicked. It just says he was wicked. The point is, in judgment, there's a difference. Some are rewarded. One was rewarded negatively. So the brief question here is, how would you be rewarded? Think about your life. Think about your belongings. God has entrusted everything to you. One of the things I've been charged with by the elders is to do the budget for next year. By God's grace, I'm fairly good at that. I started out, one of my early responsibilities here way back was to be the church administrator, as well as the school administrator a little later. And I, I understand that stuff reasonably well. The problem is, there's not quite enough money coming in. It's a little tight. It's particularly tight to do everything we want to do. You saw a really good staff up here. And they want to add, they want to replace me 
with somebody younger and, and somebody who will cost more. Because I'm old and I'm cheap. You get what you pay for. Sorry. But, but there's a challenge here. And I think some of you, I think some of you have been faithfully giving your tithe for a long time. And in this economy and everything else, uh, at times can be tough for, for, for folks. But we need to pray. And we need to ask ourselves. You need to not judge anybody else. And nobody knows who gives what. But we need to ask ourselves. Am I being responsible with what the Lord has given me in the way he wants me to? If we even approach the top, the scripture points to, and that's fodder for another whole sermon, we probably wouldn't have any kind of shortfall. We could hire two pastors. But I just want to, the church is going to be okay, but not as okay as it could be, because it's thin right now, just so you know. So how would the Lord judge you when you look at your checkbook? How would the Lord judge you when you look at your calendar? How would the Lord judge you? And this is between you and him. It's simply that, because many, too many times we don't, we don't really examine ourselves closely. One, one thing to do can be helpful is at the end of the day, when you're going to bed, when you're trying to fall asleep, it's always good to pray when you're trying to fall asleep, because Satan will put you to sleep quick. But, but when you're thinking about that, review your day. Look for missed opportunities. Look for times when you blew it. Confess them before the Lord. Look for times when you could have shared your faith, but you didn't. Confess that. And, and as you do that, it doesn't have to take more than a few minutes. As you just review the day that God has given you, and how you use that day, that gift of time, it'll help you think through more clearly about how to spend the next day. Because the judgment's coming. Final thing here. The Lord doesn't accept excuses. Notice the response of the wicked and lazy servant. It wasn't my fault. Look at you, he says to the master. He talks about the character of the master. You're a hard man. You're a hard man who gathers where you haven't planted. What's he saying here? You're a cheater? You're a thief? How do you reap where you haven't sown? Well, you go into somebody else's field and take it, I guess. I mean, it's not, not very kind what he says. If he didn't plant, he must have stolen it. He calls into question the master's character blaming his master for his inaction. I was afraid you might even send me to prison, so I did the only reasonable thing. I hid it. Now, we don't really understand the culture. It wasn't always safe to put it in the bank. Not like banks today, where it's fairly safe. But he's called onto, cart, onto account by the master who says, you could have at least put it in the bank. Do you know the prevailing interest rate I've read According in that time was something like 12%. There's a law in finance that's called the law of 72. If you take the percent of interest you're getting and divide it into 72, it'll tell you how many years it takes for your money to double. Well, if you do that with 12%, his money would have doubled in six years. He would have been fine. Now, it doesn't say how long he was gone. Maybe he's only gone three years. And three years is a long time if you're sitting there waiting for somebody to return. But it would have still been, it would have still been 6%. So he calls him on it. He says, you know, it's not about me being nicer. It's not about your excuses. What are you going to say? When you say, well, Lord, if only. And it doesn't matter what you say, if only. If only I'd lived a little longer. If only I'd been a little richer. If only I'd had a, a different husband or a different wife. If only, if only my kids had, hadn't been so demanding. If only. The, the Lord's not going to really care about the excuse. The Lord doesn't want us to only be involved in his work or in his church on Sunday. 
The reason we have programs is to extend the reach of the church. Programs aren't the be-all and the end-all by any means, and I think they probably will change in the, in the years to come. But he wants us to be a vibrant living organism with everyone involved doing something for the kingdom. An amazing church when that happens. Is the Lord happy? Is the Lord happy that you never thank him for food? When you go out to eat at a restaurant, do you thank him? I was, I was on a mission trip once to Scotland. We got there a little late. We were at dinner in a, in a restaurant. And we were sitting there, and the food's on the table, and everybody is waiting for somebody to pray. I wasn't in charge. Somebody else was in charge. Somebody else, one of the Scottish gentlemen was there. Nobody said anything. And everybody knew we were waiting for somebody to pray. But it was in a restaurant. There were 20 of us. What do you do? I don't, I don't, I don't, just, I don't want to feel stupid. Now, you know one of, the, one of the blessings of being on a mission trip in a foreign country is it doesn't matter if they already think you're stupid anyway. And it really doesn't matter because nobody knows you. I was hungry. Wrong motivation. So I stood up. And in my best Sunday morning voice, somewhat deeper than at the moment, I said to the entire restaurant, let us pray. Everybody looked up, and then their heads went down. It was cool. <laughs> and then we ate. And the Scottish people weren't quite sure what to do with me the rest of the week. <laughs> but, but that's uncommon. I wouldn't do that at Applebee's down the road here necessarily. But what do we do? Are we shy about our faith? We offer excuses? Are we like the third man wasting opportunities? Is your life one of lukewarm commitment to the Lord? Does he only want Sunday morning involvement? Notice what happens to that man. The talent's taken away. The opportunity goes away. It's done. And he cast the man out. Now, scholars argue back and forth whether that man was really saved and just lost his reward, or he really was never saved because his works displayed very little interest in the Lord. Personally, I think because he was called wicked and because he was cast out into darkness, which is always typically torment and hell, I think he was not saved. And this was simply a revelation of who he was, really. But he says, on that day, in Matthew 7, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. King James says iniquity, I think. You see, it's not quite as simplistic on the one hand as we try to make it. It's not just all you have to do is have walked the aisle one Sunday morning and you're good for life. You bought the so-called so fire insurance. Grace is what we're saved by, but grace never condones irresponsibility. Even those who are given less are obliged to use and develop what they have. Don't mourn what you don't have. Celebrate what you do have. As you wait, as you live your life, stay awake. That's what he's saying to the disciples on the, on the Mount of Olives. As you're looking at this temple, as you're exalting yourself in this temple, understand there's changes coming. I think it was something like four or five hundred years later, the rabbis would meet every year at that same spot. And they would look down on the Temple Mount where the temple sat in ruins. And under the Romans, it became a garbage dump. And they would sit there every year and mourn and weep and carry on like really only they can and talk about the day when the Lord will return. As you wait... As you live your life, remember the emphasis of these 
parables was to stay awake and to use the moment. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, I referred to it briefly earlier, according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Your faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior is your foundation. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test and sort what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. If the work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Take stock of yourself. Take stock of your life. Examine yourselves. We're not called to judge one another. That's not our job. We're called to judge ourselves. We're called to live for Christ. We're called to use the talents he's given us for his glory. And part of that, part of that emphasis to keep us focused and keep us clear, the Lord gave it to the disciples. In a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. And, and he gave us this as a reminder that it all starts with him. It's all built up with him. So if, if you don't have one of these cups, then raise your hands and uh, someone will come, I trust, and deliver it to you. Or you can come forward and get it. We have one over here. Who are our deacons serving here? Nate, come on, right over here. We got all the purple sleeves back there. Now, when you, uh, when you get these, if you look at them, it sort of looks like a coffee creamer. I apologize for that. Um, you'll see, looking down, there's a little white circular thing. That's the bread. And when we peel it off, there's two peels. One is the bread, and then under that will be the, the cup. It can be a little complicated. I have fingers that don't always work, so I don't always get it. But this is the, uh, this is the COVID preferred way to do communion today. <laughs> so no one has to prepare it or spread germs over it. I was in Episcopal Church one time a number of years ago, lovely service, and then they shared the cup, literally. Everybody drank out of the same chalice. Uh, yeah, that would work, wouldn't it, today? Uh, but we're all doing this at the same time, and the purpose of this is symbolic that we are all sharing the body and blood of Christ. We are all proclaiming in this that I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I have committed myself to him, and I want you to, to think in your mind of Jesus at that Last Supper, looking around each of them. As it says in Corinthians, when night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks and he said, this is my body. And I think when he did that, he looked each one of them in the eye. This is my body. Each of you understand, this is my body which is given for you. And he does the same thing with the cup after supper. And we are called to examine ourselves so that we don't eat or drink in an unworthy manner. Now for us, for us here today, as we, as a congregation, gather together, celebrating communion, the call is to examine yourself to see whether you're in sin, a sin that needs to be walked away from, confessed, admitted, confessed, and, and dealt with, or perhaps, perhaps whether there's areas of your life that really aren't being given over to the Lord. So let's take a moment as we pray and examine ourselves before the Lord. Father, we come today thankful for the word that you give us. Thankful, Lord, for the opportunities you give us to serve you. Recognizing, Lord, that we have come together today in this place because you've drawn us together. And you have invited us to partake of this bread and this cup in memory of what Christ did for us. Lord, I pray for anyone here this day 
that has never accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For this cup is only for those who have. If that's you, while others are praying, even for themselves, I want to invite you, if you've never accepted Christ, to do that right now. Confess your sins to him in the quietness of your heart. Accept that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood to pay for your sins, and rose again on the third day to seal the deal. And just come to him and say, Lord, I believe. I'm putting my faith and trust in you. Cleanse me of these sins. Give me the opportunities to serve you in the days to come. If you've heard that, he's answered you. He's put his spiritual arms around you, and he invites you to this table. And if you're a believer, examine yourself. What needs to change? What needs to be confessed? What do you need to deal with in this moment? If you can't totally deal with it, make a commitment to do so in the next 24 hours. Lord, help each one of us to respond in this moment to you in the way that would please you the most. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Now peel back, if you can, the top part. of your cup. I trust we've all been served. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of him. Let's pray together in the prayer that's been said here for a long time. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body which was given for me. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Pray with me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body which was given for me. Let's eat together. Same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he gave thanks, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new agreement I'm making with all of you. All of you drink this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again. Once again, let's thank him by praying together. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood, which was shed for me. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your blood, which was shed for me. Let's drink together. Lord, we give you thanks for that which you've done for us and for this reminder of your death on the cross, that we might, as often as we do it, be reminded of what it cost you and recommit ourselves to serving you. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. stand and uh, our closing hymn is uh, is take my life and let it be and please really just think about what these words mean uh, after the wonderful sermon that we heard God's word being preached to us so eloquently and, and and also of course taking our communion and what that means for us as believers and uh, just please remember what what all of that means to you personally and what it means to us as a church and as, as, a, as, as, the, as the church universal as well. Um, this song also contains a chorus, a contemporary chorus. I am yours, set apart for you. I am yours, hungry, hungry for your truth. Take my life, you are all I live for. I am yours.
Father, may our lives in the week to come be just what we've sung. May we commit ourselves afresh every day to the opportunities, to the talents you've given us and serve you with them, that you might be glorified in, with, and through us. Bless us, Lord, as we go, for we go in Jesus' name. Amen.